evening, goeienavond. Man, what a positive, blessed vibe in this place. Uh, I must admit, I'm slightly intimidated or overwhelmed by so many young people. You know, the little church where we come from, my wife and I are regarded as part of the youth. Uh, and... Uh, so that is why when Sias phoned my pastor and asked him to send a couple of his youth to come and testify here, he suggested that we come. So that is why we're here tonight. Uh, I just want to share a little bit of our testimony. And uh, then afterwards I would just like to share a little bit of the lessons that, that, that we have learned in the mission field. Now, many of you will say, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I, I haven't been called as a missionary. Now, let me tell you, God is so full of surprises. We started the church in Franschhoek, and for us, it was just all about our church, our fellowship. Every Sunday, praise and worship and uh, love feasts and uh, fellowship, and every Sunday is exactly the same. But it shouldn't stop there. We should go a little bit further. And the Jere moest me met a slap rim vang om my daar te kry. He had to trick me into going to the mission field. And this is how it happened. Uh, I used to be the pharmacist, the only pharmacist in Franschhoek. And December 1994, 14th of December, we were so busy in the pharmacy. Uh, at that time I was the only gift shop in Franschhoek. And in walks uh, a lady. Now, her husband uh, was a pastor in Belleville, and for a few years we used to fellowship with them. And I was there for an elder for quite a few years. And uh, so I said to her, Ingeborg, what are you doing here? She says, Man, uh, my, wife, my, my, my husband and I, Christo, have been doing missionary work in Russia and in Ukraine for the past four months, but our church won't extend our leave, so we have to come back. So I thought, well, seeing that I was an elder there, I better also say something spiritual now. So I said, uh, you know, I've always said to the Lord, if he wants to use me, I wouldn't mind going to Russia. She says, are you serious? She says, look at the goosebumps. I said, ooh. Now I've painted myself into a corner. I can't now turn around and say, <laughs> sorry, I was just joking. <laughs> and, and I knew that I'd said too much. And three days later, we got a fax from, from Ukraine. Those days, just faxes. Uh, fax from, from Ukraine. Uh, we invite you to join our staff. It was an American uh, television company that uh, had a uh, once-off Bible school for a, uh, a year, was the best Bible school in the former USSR in those days. Uh, please join our staff. And I said to Dressy, look, what are we... She started laughing. She says, oh, we, Russia, man, you know, we're so scared of the communism. Communists, you know, it's not for us. So about five days later, we got another fax. What is your reply? So I said, stop laughing and start praying because, I mean, these guys are now very serious. And uh, so uh, I said, all right, we'll come for four months. I thought, I'm going to backtrack and put them off. They said, that will suit us 100%. So then we got a, another fax from them. And there was a questionnaire. And in the questionnaire was, what is your ministry? So I said, well, what is our ministry? I preach, we lead the worship, we clean the toilets, we put out the chairs, and, and we do everything. What is that? So I wrote them. I said, I am a very emotional person, and I cry very easily. My wife has got a very infectious laughter. If you can use that, we'll come. <laughs> so, so for about 10 days, we, there was no reply. We eventually, we get another fax. Please come. We believe we can use your ministry. So that is how we landed there. And our lives were irrevocably, irrevocably changed.
because we were prepared to say, yes, Lord, I'll come. Since we were, got born again, we got saved. All the people just thought, you must work for God. You must work for God. And did we work for God? But not one person in all those years ever told me about an intimate, loving relationship with the bridegroom of the church. Now, when we left South Africa, I took a lot of so many Bible translations and a stack of prepared sermons. We weren't going to teach those, German, those, those, those Russians. Not realizing, and take this thought, not realizing that God was waiting there for us and he was going to work the 2080 principle in our lives. 80% work in us and only 20% through us. And it was a bit of a shock. But this is one of the, I just want to share two of the greatest lessons that I learned there. If you look at the map, the world map, you'll see that South Africa and Ukraine are on the same timeline. When it's 12 o'clock noon here, it's 12 o'clock noon there. My wife and I were fast asleep in our apartment and the phone rang. Those phones, normal, I believe, you know. There were no, no cell phones in those days. And uh, by the sound of the ringing, I heard it was a long distance call. A long distance call, it must be from South Africa. And I looked at my watch and I saw it was 2.30 in the morning. Who would phone me from South Africa unless it was death or a serious accident? or grave illness. With a bouncing heart, I picked up the phone. I heard it was my eldest son. I said, Tommy, what's wrong? He says, Dad, I just want to hear your voice again. I love you so much, and I miss you terribly. And he put the phone down. At that moment, my chest cavity had become too small for me because my, I felt my heart had swollen to three times the size. And I realized immediately, if my son had said to me, Dad, I'm, I can't keep it anymore uh, for myself, but if you get home, you'll find there's a new Mercedes Benz in your garage or I'll have paint at your house, I would have been glad. But nothing would have caused this pride and joy in my heart. And I realized it's not what my son does for me or what my son gives to me, but what my son has become to me. My relationship with my son. And just there, the Holy Spirit spoke to, us, to me. And he said, that's the relationship your Heavenly Father desires from you. It's not what you and I do for God or what we give to God that makes his heart swell with pride and joy when he looks down at his children. But it's my relationship with him that will make his heart swell with pride and joy. True ministry is what I become to God. And my dear little friends, you don't dare go to the mission field just with a knowledge about God. You must know him intimately. Because there in the mission field, we arrived there. We were blind, deaf, and dumb. You cannot read the language because it's Cyrillic alphabet. We couldn't understand what they said. And we couldn't speak the language. And we became so deeply dependent on the Holy Spirit. But just there, Colossians 1.27 became a revelation to me. Christ in me, my only hope of glory. What is this glory? The Greek word is doxa. It is the character and the personality and the nature of God that becomes visible or evident 
in the life of a believer. So, to be continually conscious of Christ in me, because I have died and I live no more, longer, but it's Christ who lives in me. So I must be constantly conscious of Christ in me, not conscious of Christ on a Sunday evening when the band starts playing. That is a religion. Jesus didn't come to die for a religion, but for an intimate, loving relationship with each one of you. And even if you forget everything that I've said, this you must remember. Jesus was truly God and truly man. Therefore, the church is truly mankind. Truly Christ and truly mankind. There is not another Christ in you than he who dwells in heaven. He is Christ wrapped up in glory in heaven, but he is a, the same Christ wrapped in this body of flesh here on earth. And you and I must fight that temptation that wants to cause this life-changing message to become just merely part of my theology instead of a reality. Christ lives in me. Because my brother and sister, it is right here in the carrying of the actual presence of Christ in me that I fulfill God's purpose with my life. But if Jesus is still far away from me, up somewhere, don't know where, what, then I still live and do things in my own strength. Let's make it practical. My wife, she's only 35, but we've been married for 58 years now. Uh, I will recognize her voice, her footsteps in the middle of the night. Her voice I will recognize among a million other voices. Her laughter among a billion other laughters. How can I do that? Because I live intimately with her. And because I love her so much, I try and spend most of my time in her presence. You cannot learn to know someone or to love someone intimately by living outside his or her presence. And to live and walk in the Spirit is to be continually conscious of Christ in me. See, I didn't, I didn't plan for this. But, brother, you come here. Why do we struggle so much with our daily struggle? We fall and we stand up and we fall and whatnot. You chain me and this brother together for a whole week. Wherever I go, he goes. Where I go to the beach and those bronze and half-naked bodies, when I look at them, he'll say to me, brother, turn your eyes upon Jesus. <laughs> uh, amen. amen. Yeah. I dare not tell a coarse joke because I'm conscious of this guy next to me. I dare not lie or gossip because I'm constantly conscious of him. He'll reprimand me. Won't we have a week of holiness? But now if I know Christ lives in me, I can enjoy a lifetime of holiness. Amen. Brother, it's been a wonderful week with you. Eh? Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. And my wife and I started practicing the presence of Christ in our lives. And when we, after a few months, we thought, oh, we've really got it. Then we were invited by a church. It's a small, uh, it just uh, been planted. But he had two cell groups in the church. The one group consisted of the yuppie crowd like you, all the teachers and the students and the doctors and the dentists and whatnot. And the other, other, other group was consisted of 
about 25 old Russian grannies called babushkas. And uh, uh, it was very cold that, that, that night. And uh, there they were sitting. Most of the glasses, the one arm is missing, so they keep on holding the glasses like this, you know. None of them had a Bible, because the Bibles were three rand approximately in those days, and it was too expensive for them. None of them could read or write. All they knew was Jesus saves. And for that little bit of knowledge, they were prepared to be denied education. Their children were denied education. They were imprisoned. They were sent to Siberia to the gulags. Many of them died there. And here I sit with all my knowledge. And they sit there expecting, looking at me with such great expectation from, for the man of Africa is going to tell him something. I said to my friend, you know, whatever I try and teach these people, it will be way over their heads. But then one, one of them stood up. I said, I just want to testify. Last week, we had no food. And God sent us a cabbage. And we had soup for the week. He is Jehovah Jireh. He supplies all my needs. Another, said, another one said, same thing happened to us. God sent us a bread. Truly, he's the one that supplies all my needs. And I said, Lord, I've learned to supply my own needs by working with my own hands. I've heard that you supply. I've got a home. I've got two cars. I've got a, a fridge and a deep freeze. Not once have I gone to bed worrying how will I feed my children next day. I've heard that you are Jehovah Jireh, but I do not know you as a God who supplies my needs. Then another one stood up and said, God healed me from breast cancer. Another one from depression. And so they testified. I said, Lord, I'm a pharmacist. My first stop is the pill. If I've got a pain, and if the pill doesn't work, then the doctor and Lord bless the hands of the doctor. I've got nothing against the doctors. They want to do wonderful work. But I've never been in a situation that only God could intervene and heal me. I've heard so many testimonies of healing, but he's never healed me. I do not know him as a God who heals me. So they testified. To my brothers and sisters, since those days, my wife and I have embarked on a journey of knowing God, of knowing God, that has changed our whole outlook. And we can just give all the praise and the glory to God. My, my second point, would, what is that? 15 points. I'll come short, my message is better than this. Okay. 15 out of 100, that's very bad, my dog. Uh, uh, the second one is that God had to teach me what passion is. Now, I know all of you think you've got a passion, but meanwhile, it's a desire. Someone desire a husband, and many of them desire a wife. And all but those are not the passions. The, the dictionary says passion. It is when you desire something so much that you are prepared to suffer to obtain that which you desire. Shouldn't every born-again Christian have but one desire? That is for souls, lost souls, to come into the kingdom of God. I know when that desire is dying in my heart. It's when I sing of heaven, but I live as if earth is my eternal home. I also know when that desire is dying, it's when I start dreaming 
of all these expensive toys that the men usually buy, the four by fours and all that kind of thing. Or when I dream about uh, places I will go and visit overseas and people I will meet and experiences I will have, instead of dreaming of the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. My brothers and sisters, if you have such a passion, you'll be the most dangerous person in Stellenbosch because the devil will fear you, but the angels of God will applaud you. Okay. So I've got 15 more minutes, hey? All right. I've jotted down a few random truths that we have noticed about church that will help you in your own journey with the Lord. Number one, the church is the only institution on earth that exists for the benefit of its non-members. It's not for you. You were saved for them. It's not about us. It's us reaching the world for Christ. Number two, we as leaders are called to make disciples and send them out to expand God's kingdom rather than capture them, count them, and keep them in their seats. Number three, those churches who make disciples understand that the front lines of evangelism and ministry are most often found in the marketplace. In other words, the places where you work, places of leisure, there where you study at varsity, the rest that you live in, and where I do my shopping, and not in, within the walls of our church buildings. Number four, when I stand before God, the ultimate measure of my ministry and stewardship will not be found in how many people we jammed into our campuses on a weekend. It will be measured but what those people did once they left the building. Pastor Sias' ministry will not be judged by how many young people he could pack into a hall on Sunday evening, but the success of his ministry will be judged by what, by what you did after you leave this building. Jesus' measure is not seating capacity, but sending capacity. Thank you.